we have seen that when we consider two vessels that have an unequal level of water in them, that is, vessel A and vessel B have differing amounts of water. So under such a circumstance, when these vessels will be connected with the pipe, water will flow, and we saw that in our previous lecture. So what can we say? We can say that whenever there is a difference in the level of water, water is flowing. As you can clearly see from this animation, the moment we connect the two vessels, water flows till the level of water becomes equal. In a similar manner, when we consider two bodies that are differently charged, that is, we consider a body that has an excess of electrons and is negatively charged, and we consider a body that has a deficit of electrons and is positively charged. And when we connect them, we will find that the electrons flow from the negatively charged body to the positively charged body, as you can see. And conventionally, it has been considered that the flow of current is in the opposite direction. So if you recall, what was the convention that was followed? It was said that the negative body is at a low potential and the positive body is at a higher potential. So electrons are flowing from the negatively charged body to the positively charged body. That is from low to high potential. And conventional current, or simply current, is flowing from a high potential to a low potential. Now, the flow of current can be considered very similar to the flow of water in the water supply system. So over here, in this animation, if you consider, we have the water station or the water supply station. We have a pump, a tank, and a home. This forms a complete circuit for the water supply. Over here, the water comes from the water supply and reaches the pump. The pump then forwards this water to the tank at our homes. Now, you must have always heard your mom or your dad say that the pump needs to be switched on in order for water to reach the tank. So when the pump at your home is switched on, the water reaches the tank. And from this tank, the water reaches the taps and other appliances like the water purifier at your home. So this complete circuit for water is how water travels inside. Now similarly, the charges also flow inside a circuit similar to how water flows. So now we are going to find out how a circuit can be constructed where charges flow from one point to another. Now over here, we are going to build a circuit that functions in a way similar to the water circuit. That is, in the water circuit, like water was flowing, in the charge circuit, charge will flow. So we consider certain wires. These wires are similar to the pipes in the water circuit. So I connect these wires, and now I connect a resistor along with the wires. This resistor is like the dirt in your water pipes. Dirt hinders the flow of water. Likewise, a resistor hinders the flow of current. Now I connect a battery or a cell to the circuit. Now what is the work of a battery? Just like there was a water supply station in case of the water circuit, we have a battery in case of an electrical circuit. The work of the battery is to circulate the charge inside the circuit. Just like the work of the water station was to circulate the water in the water circuit. Now we consider a switch. This switch is like the pump in the water circuit. It ensures that water actually flows around the circuit. In this case, the switch ensures that charge or current flows around in the circuit. Lastly, we connect a light bulb. This light bulb is like your home where the water finally reaches and is used to functional and is put to functional uses. So even in this case, 
the charges or the current reach the bulb and it is put to functional use. So now, in order to make the charges flow, I need to close the switch. That is, right now you can see that the charges are not flowing in the circuit. But the moment I close this switch, you can find that the charges begin to flow. Now you can see that the charges are flowing quite slowly. That is, the current that is flowing, or the charge per unit time through any region, is quite low. So the current is low, and the bulb is glowing dimly. Now let us say what happens if we change the voltage. You can see that the voltage is currently at 9 volts. So let's say I increase it to 25 volts. So the moment I increase the voltage, you will find that more current is flowing through the circuit and the bulb is glowing to a greater extent. It is glowing brightly. If I increase the voltage further, more current will flow and the bulb will glow even more brightly. Now let us say we change the value of the resistance. As I told you earlier, resistance is like the dirt in your pipe. It hinders the flow of water. So in this case, the resistance hinders the flow of electrons. Now the value of resistance is 10 ohms. I want to increase it to let's say 20 ohms. So the moment I increase the resistance, you will find that the flow of current decreases. If I further increase the resistance, let's say to almost 45 ohms, you will find that the flow of current has further decreased and the bulb is glowing even more dimly. So this is how a circuit in electric considerations performs. Here we saw the illustration of how the electric circuit is performing under various conditions of voltage and resistance and how the current is flowing accordingly. So if we consider a simple circuit like we saw in the simulation, we have a switch, a cell or the battery which was providing the current, the resistor which was hindering the flow of current and the bulb. Now, If you take a close look at this circuit, one thing must obviously strike your mind that if you have to draw this particular circuit, it will be quite tedious and tiresome. Because if you have to draw this cell like this is, the switch, the bulb, or even the resistor, it will be quite a tedious and tiresome task. So do you think this is how we draw a circuit? Well, the answer is no. This is not how we draw a circuit. In fact, drawing a circuit is quite simple due to certain symbols and conventions that are used for the objects or the elements in a circuit. Now we are going to find out how we can actually draw a circuit in a simple manner. So first we consider the cell or the battery that was being used. You will find that when you draw a cell in a circuit, you do not have to draw such in details. You have to draw only this particular symbol. This symbol actually depicts a cell inside a circuit. You will find that just like the cell has a positive end and a negative end, the same is depicted on the symbol in this manner. The cell in the symbol also has a positive end and a negative end. The positive end is denoted by a longer vertical line and the negative end is depicted by a shorter vertical line. Likewise, for a resistor that you saw in the picture being shown as this, we can depict a resistor in a circuit diagram with this zigzag-like symbol. Now we learn about a rheostat. A rheostat is nothing but a variable resistance or a resistance whose value you can change. Over here you will see the picture of a rheostat and you must be thinking that how difficult it will be to draw a rheostat if we have to incorporate it in a circuit. Now if you observe closely, this rheostat has what is known as a sliding contact. This sliding contact is moved from one end to the other in order to change the resistance of, these, of this wire that is coiled around the rheostat. 
So on sliding the contact, we are able to change the resistance of this wire. Thus, it is a variable resistance. And in a circuit, a rheostat is depicted by this symbol or this symbol, which depicts variable resistance. Likewise, even a switch can be depicted by symbols. As we saw that this is the picture of a switch that is normally used inside a circuit. So a switch can be depicted by either of these two symbols. We can depict a switch using this symbol. Over here, no contact in between this part and this part indicates that the switch is off. That is, there is no direct contact between these two terminals of the switch. But the moment there is a direct contact between the two terminals of the switch, the switch is on and it will enable the current to flow. That is, the circuit gets completed. Likewise, we can also depict a switch using this symbol. Over here, we find an incomplete circle, which is blank in the middle. This indicates that the switch is in off position. Now, the moment we incorporate this dark circle inside it, it indicates that the switch is on, the circuit is complete, and current will flow. Now, there are certain instruments which are used in a circuit for different purposes. This instrument is known as an ammeter. The picture of an ammeter is as you can see on the screen. If you notice closely, the ammeter has certain readings or certain marks on the face of it. These are for reading the current that flows inside the circuit. So the job of an ammeter is to basically measure the amount of current that is flowing in a particular circuit. So in that way, an ammeter is pretty useful because from the reading on this meter, we can say how much current is flowing in a circuit. An ammeter is usually used to detect from small amounts of current to very large amounts of current as well. And this is the symbol by which ammeters are used in circuits. Likewise, just as we saw, we could measure currents. We can also measure voltage. Now, this is the picture of a voltmeter that is used to measure voltage or the voltage difference or the potential difference between any two points in a given circuit. As you can see from these marks or readings on the voltmeter, we are able to read the value of voltage. And in a circuit, the voltmeter is depicted by this symbol. We have another instrument that is known as the galvanometer. Now, the galvanometer is just like an ammeter, except for the fact that it is only able to measure very small amounts of current. As you can see from the picture of the galvanometer, it is measuring currents in the order of microampere. That is a very, very small amount of current. Now, the only difference in between the galvanometer and the ammeter is number one, that the galvanometer cannot measure large amounts of current like the ammeter can. And number two, the galvanometer can actually detect the direction of current. That is in which direction current is flowing. So if the galvanometer has a deflection of the needle towards this point, towards this end, it means current is flowing in this direction. If the galvanometer needle is deflected towards this end, it means current is flowing in this direction. And the symbol for the galvanometer in a circuit is given by this G symbol. Now we saw that the current was used to light up the bulb. Now drawing a bulb can be a very elaborate process. This elaborate process is simplified by the use of this symbol, which can be used to draw a bulb in a circuit diagram. Also we saw that to connect the various elements in a circuit, we are using wires. Now these wires need not be shown as turned and twisted and curved. Wires can be simply depicted by considering straight lines. So this is a simplified circuit diagram. You will notice that this is the same diagram that we had earlier seen in a much more elaborate way. So as you can see, when we incorporate the various conventions for the symbols for the different elements in a circuit, drawing of the entire circuit diagram becomes very simple. 
here we have used the convention for cell resistor the bulb as well as the switch so thus we learned that in order to draw a circuit diagram we need not draw elaborate pictures of the different elements in a circuit there are certain symbols which follow certain conventions with the help of which we can simplify and draw a certain a circuit diagram in the manner as you can see on the screen